Fishing the DMV is the number one fishing show in our region, reaching thousands upon thousands of avid anglers and outdoor enthusiasts each and every week. As the show continues to grow, we are now actively looking for a company who would be interested in becoming the presenting partner of Fishing the DMV. If you are looking to promote your company to a highly engaged audience passionate about fishing, outdoor adventures, and conservation efforts in the Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania area, please email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Again, if you're a company interested in joining and becoming a part of the number one fishing show that continues to grow in leaps and bounds each and every month, email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today I have one of those guys that is in high demand. Uh, everyone keeps asking me to bring this man on. And finally, we've got our schedules together. He is, if you have a problem with a kayak and you really live in the DMV area, Maryland, Northern Virginia, Pennsylvania, you probably go to this guy. Uh, Trey, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know you're busy. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here. Glad we can make it work. Most people, when they get into fishing, you know, they don't want to become like into the marketing, the media marketing or building kayaks. It's always like, I want to become a professional bass angler, uh, you know, either in bass, a boat, a kayak. How did you get started in this industry? Um, a little backstory before that. I've always, my dad was a welder fabricator. So I started really young. I started welding at eight. Um, what? And, and that kind of leads into how I got started in the kayak thing. I've always done local repair, uh, farmers or just local homeowners stuff that needs repaired and stuff like that. So um, my wife actually worked for the local health department and at the time, Jeff Little, I think everybody knows Jeff Little. Jeff Little was working for the nursing home and he was in charge of the, the kitchen, the cafeteria. You're and kidding. Food. So my wife was his inspector and they got to talking and one thing led to another. And, um, you know, they got to talking about me and how I liked fishing and stuff like that. I was a jet boat guy at the time. And um, we so she got him in contact with me because he needed some fabrication done. Long story short, it was when he worked for Torquedo and uh, he needed uh, some things made for actually a travel motor for um, the sailboat industry and the pontoon boats. And then uh, so he he brought these motors up to me and and he dropped them off. And, and I Googled these motors because I'd never heard of Torquedo before. Uh, this was the end of 2017. Wow. And uh, he said he's like, can you make he just wanted me to make um some type of weed cutter so that when the pontoon boats and the sailboats would come in to the docks and stuff and, and go through the weeds that it just wouldn't choke the prop up. So I, I made something very like just basic, uh, simple design that we could build on from there. And uh, when he saw it, he said, uh, is this something that you would, that you would manufacture? I said, I, I've never really been in much into the manufacturing cause I like using my brain. I like, I like designing stuff to solve problems. The manufacturing, it's, it's, it's repetitive. It can be boring. It's cumbersome. Like it, it's, it's never been my thing. I said, but you know, if it pays the bills, I'm willing to give it a try. So we actually started with the, the 403 rock guard was the first thing that we started manufacturing, um, in the spring of 2018. And, uh, Jeff took them to, um, the KBF national championship that year. And we sold quite a few of them. And then it just, it snowballed from there. I'd always wanted to do something in the outdoor industry for hunting or fishing because it's my passion, but I didn't know how to incorporate that into fabrication and welding. And it just kind of found me with Jeff Little. Circling back, you started welding at eight? Yep. Holy shit. How did... Yeah, my, my dad was a fabricator. Uh, he had his own business. So I started really young. Uh, doing stuff for him and then working. I, I did my own side work when I was like 12 years old. I had my own customers that, you know, my dad, he was busy. Uh, so he would pass some people to me. And, and that's how I got started in the industry. And kids nowadays have safe spaces and they're just absolute snowflakes. I really wish I had a talented yeah. skill like that back in the day. Um, 
it just gets your brain wired correctly when you actually work and you learn some kind of skill. Yeah, I've got two boys of my own. Uh, one just turned 15 yesterday and uh, my my other son is 10. So my 15 year old, he's really going down a similar path as I did. He's really into uh, using his mind to create things. He, he loves forging knives, which is oh, something I've always wanted cool. to do, but I never had time to learn. And uh, like three years ago for Christmas, he asked for a forge and and he's been messing around with knives. So we've kind of learned together and uh, he's pretty passionate about that. But he loves doing everything that we do. And, and he's actually uh, started doing some competitive kayak fishing with me as well. How hard is like the knife forging? Because I've just seen that on like those stupid shows on Netflix. Like, uh, what was it? Knife Forge, like uh, the contest show. Yeah, Forged in Fire. That's actually yeah. where it started for him. He saw it and he was like, <laughs> I, I want to do that. <laughs> You know, we can learn together. So um, it's if you don't have the power tools, it's it's labor intensive when you get the right steels because you can you can forge regular mild steel and it's not terrible. But you get the stuff that they they're supposed to use for knives, the harder stuff. It it takes takes a lot. But uh, I think it's actually helped kind of get him into shape a little bit. He's a football player and a wrestler. So oh, uh, it's kind of a workout. That is freaking hardcore. Um, yeah. You you mentioned you've always had this this desire to invent and create things. Uh, before the Rock Guard, did you dabble in any kind of like things that you wrote down or or things that you did build? It was more of like a customer would come to me and they said they they needed something built. Uh, I would say my most bizarre thing I've ever made. Uh, I had a a friend growing up. His parents. I don't know if you've ever heard of the uh, Contocton Wildlife Zoo. It's in Thurmont, Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty decent sized zoo in our area. Uh, the My dad did a lot of fabrication for them. He actually helped build the grizzly bear pen when I was a kid, which was cool because I got to see all this stuff and kind of backstage stuff at a zoo. But so their son, uh, he started doing like a traveling petting zoo and he was uh, he had camels and and they would do camel rides. You know, they would go on the road and do like the Renaissance festivals and stuff like that. But then he would go and if someone had the money he would set up camel rides at a birthday party and they would give camel rides like people would do uh like pony rides but they were camels and uh he's like hey i need a a camel ride stand and i was like okay so wh what are we talking like you know how <laughs> tall does this thing have to be and and he's like well it needs to be this tall and this big and hold this amount of people but it also needs to be able to fold up and put in my trailer so we had to engineer something that basically was a was like a six by eight platform that folded up into like a, a four by six area and um uh, you know wow. that was probably one of the most elaborate projects i've ever done as far as you know make, designing it so it, it works a certain way um and that's one of my most memorable projects too i was i think i was 17 when i built that um, holy shit dude but but just stuff like that you know somebody comes to me with a problem um and, and to be able to use my mind and to, and to make something work, I'm, I'm a people pleaser and I'm a perfectionist. I like to have everything, you know, working the way it should. And if the customer's not happy, I'm not happy. So, and a lot of times when the customer is happy, I think, well, I could have done a better job, but the customer's happy. So, um, I'm never completely happy with what I've done. I've always thinking, you know, there's a better way to do it. At 17, you probably already accomplished more than a lot of people do in a lifetime. And I think, uh, a giraffe story like that would be the highlight of their lives. And you're just getting, getting started here. So it, you, you get with Jeff, you create the, the, this really, I mean, I think everyone that I see with a torpedo has this bad boy on there that fishes the rivers around here. And, and mm -hmm. so we got the, the business side of things up to this point, how much fishing were you doing between, you know, I, I guess from a kid all the way up until you meet Jeff around that 2019 timeframe. So when I was a kid, uh, lived near the Monocacy River uh, mm. outside of Frederick, Maryland. So I grew up catfishing. Oh, you're right near uh, me. Oh, dang. Yeah, I, I grew up fishing for catfish. I would catch a bass every once in a while, some panfish. But um, when I was a teenager, got my license, my buddy and I, buddies and I, we used to always hang out at the river uh, Friday, Saturday nights. That's where we always were. So fishing's always been a big part of my, my past and, and definitely my present. But... Um, I worked with a guy, I think 2010 is, is about the time, you know, and he's like, oh man, you need to go bass fishing with me. I was like, ah, 
I, I've never been bass fishing. I've seen it on TV. He's like, no, until you do it yourself. He's like, it, so he, it was about six months and he talked me into going, um, he had a, uh, a reservoir rig and he took me on black Hills Lake hmm. and, and my first fish was like a two and a half pound large mouth on a buzz bait. And I was hooked ever since. Um, so I went fishing with him a couple times and they got me or he got me started and, and, uh, it really got me hooked. And, and, and I learned as much as I could from him. I was a sponge, you know, soaking up as much information as I could. And then, um, I lived, we, we had moved from Frederick County to outside of Hancock, Maryland. And so we were on the upper Potomac river way up there. And, uh, so a lot of the guys up there, smallmouth fished with jet boats and then it evolved into, you know, me getting a jet boat. I ended up building a jet boat. Um, Dude, that's awesome. a, yeah, I put a, I took the, the jet outboard off of a 1648 dirt craft and I put a jet ski engine in it oh, that shit. was about 120 horsepower. So when I did it, I cut the whole bottom out of the boat, put heavier aluminum on the bottom. I went with three sixteenths aluminum and then UHMW plastic and, um, uh, you know, so I could hit rocks and stuff and not worry about gouging the bottom and it would do about 40 miles per hour and two inches of water. So, um, Jesus. It, it was, uh, it was fun. It gave me that adrenaline rush that oh, yeah. you know, if you weren't catching fish, you go <laughs> run around and, and get your adrenaline rush. But, uh, we, uh, and it just evolved from there. It, it's, it's gotten the passions just keeps growing ever since I got started fishing for bass. So, it's it's crazy that you don't have to be in it from age six to make a difference in the industry or even to get into the industry. Um, and you see this, like, I guess the extreme example would be like a Carl Jockamson, you know, going to Australia and stuff, but even like mm -hmm. fishing, catfish in the Monocacy and then switching over and, and here you are. Yeah. Are you still in Hancock area? No. So, uh, 2000, actually about the time I started doing kayak stuff, we, we were building a house back in Frederick County where, uh, in Mount area, Maryland. And, um, so we built a house here, moved here and I actually started the business in the basement of a brand new house. Cause I didn't have a shop at the time. So, uh, spent two years fabricating parts out of the basement and then finally got to the point to where I was able to build a shop. And then, you know, now we have a 30 by 50 garage outside it's a pole building that i work out of well i mean most legends and in, in the big time inventors it's either a garage or a basement so that's kind of par for the course so you get the rock guard built up and then you know the website and kind of the your brand like how did that was that already built when you created the rock guard or was that still something you were working out no so my uh, original business is sdl services my my real name is sterling douglas leach uh, so, uh, trying to keep the family name going, my, you know, I'm the third, so, uh, it kept the family name going in the business. And then, um, I, uh, I started, uh, after we started making the parts and stuff, we, we created the brand innovative sportsman because I didn't, I'd had small businesses before and I didn't want to like pigeonhole the name just for kayak fishing in case we ever want to branch out Smart. beyond that. Smart. Um, and I've done that with businesses before where, where you, the name was what the business was. And if you ever wanted to branch out, you would almost have to change the name. I didn't want to have to deal with that going down the road. So, um, we ran the, the brand name under, uh, our original business, which is SDL services. So we're, you know, doing business as innovative sportsmen. And then, um, you know, it just kind of grew from there, learned how to uh, learn how to do everything from go. I, I was, learned how to use or to outsource to be able to manufacture parts um, in a more timely manner and build a website, uh, the whole social media thing. I had a little bit of experience before with a previous business, but never really dove into social media advertising and, and everything that goes with that. And I still, I still struggle with that to this day, you know, taking pictures and advertising and it's just, you're so busy that it's one of the last things on my mind and I try to do the best I can, but, um, you know, Jeff really helps a lot with that as well with the things that he's done for us. Yeah. It, being a small business owner, you have to juggle so many hats and then plus keep a clientele list if you're doing custom work. And, and when you're dealing with like, uh, and I'll keep bringing up the rock proof guard before we move into your, your latest and greatest, um, invention, 
are you by hand making every single rot guard? Are you are you taking that and letting somebody else do that at this point? Like if somebody built gets something from you, is everything that has to be done through you or do you have someone else helping? Originally it was until about a year and a half ago. So I would say um, right, let's say towards the end of 2022, um, I just, my, my wife saw that I was stressed out. I was busy. I was behind. She's like, why don't you, why don't we try and find someone that, that can do this? I was like, I don't know how, like I, I, so she gets on Facebook and she, she puts on our, our community page, Hey, are there any welder fabricators out there that would be interested in talking about doing some work? And she actually got a response, um, from a lady who was the wife of a fabricator. That's about 40 minutes from us. He's in Hmm. Westminster, Maryland. And, um, he's a retired military starting his own business. Great guy, uh, met him. And he was one of those guys that just doesn't want to say no. Uh, so I gave him, gave him some parts and I said, here, this is, this is what I, what I'm manufacturing. These are the parts I'm making it out of. Let me know if it works for you, what the price would be. And, uh, we worked it out and, and he's been building the rock cards for me ever since. Um, actually here recently, we've been talking with some other people, you know, in the manufacturing part of it to kind of streamline everything to make it a little easier on us on the, on the backside, which we're always trying to do. Um, because if we make it easier here, then we can make products a little less expensive for, for our consumers. And, um, the, the thoughts always there on how to, how to make it better for us and for the consumer. So um, we have another fabricator who has a CNC laser. He actually cuts out our adapter plates and stuff and he has a big metal break. He bends everything. I can send him drawings and usually have stuff within a week. He's, he's very quick. Um, but just working with a lot of local people is what I try to do. There's some stuff that's outsourced to larger companies um, that we do a lot larger quantities of, but for the most part, try to keep it local and, and help out local small businesses just like us. Every small business life, there's that point where you hit that glass ceiling where you just can't do everything and then, you know, have a happy wife and kids. And I definitely feel you with that where the growing pains, it's a good thing, but it's also, it's a stressful thing too. Right. From there, you, you have, you have the website, you have this great product. Uh, and then I think the first time I saw this in person was at iCast two years ago. I think it, Jeff took it down there. The inflatable, the Osprey. Mm-hmm. What was the origins of that story? So, it, Jeff, like Jeff, Jeff has ideas up, uh, beyond ideas, beyond ideas. He, it, it's every. It used to be every week, and now that he's started with Boondocks. It's been he's been busy with Boondocks and stuff, so it's kind of slowed him down with coming to me with ideas, which, <laughs> which is fine because <laughs> it, at times it can be overwhelming, and, and he'll tell you he's like, you know, I'll bring ideas to Trey and and sometimes he'll just straight shoot them down because it's a horrible idea. Or sometimes he'll just say, you know, it, give me some time and, and it'll make it work. But, um, so Jeff started talking to me about this inflatable idea. He said, he's like, look, he's like, I've got this idea and I've pitched it to other companies and nobody wants to touch it. And at the end of the day, like I feel that I owe Jeff a lot because I am where I am right now because of Jeff. Jeff has tossed a lot of work and a lot of ideas my way. I've made them come to fruition and and made it work, but like he is he is what got me started and and you know, he he keeps me going as well. We're always in contact and stuff, but so he came to me with this inflatable idea and he had actually beforehand put me on he had a seagull fish skiff that he put me on. And, uh, it was a bigger one. So I could take my kids out on it and stuff. And I think that was him kind of planting the seed as to what an inflatable was made of and what it could do. And then he came to me with the inflatable kayak idea. And, uh, I told him, I was like, Jeff, we'll, we'll give it a whirl. And we both said, you know, if this doesn't work out, we'll end up with a pretty cool kayak that we can use personally. Um, so, uh, he came to me with the idea and it was, it was the last, but it was right before the last um, KBF at Gunnersville, I believe. I believe it was like, it was COVID time. So I think it was 2020. Um, and we had actually had the first prototype already. And he did some testing on it. I had done a little bit of testing on it. And then he said, 
or, you know, he asked me if I wanted to go to the, the national championship and um, set up down there with him at the Torquedo booth. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. It's a lake I've always wanted to see. And I like going and, and I like talking to people. I like socializing. I like getting ideas and, and people come to me with ideas or getting input on the rock guard or the adapter plates or whatever. So socializing with people is a big part of the business and helping people as much as I can. But so we went down there and we spent three days, I think it was three days down there and we did not fish Gunnersville, but we fished the local rivers and creeks around Gunnersville in Alabama, which is right up our alley. That's the type of fishing we like to do. And I was in a bona fide SS 127 for three days, dragging it along creeks and rivers and everything else. And then when I got back home, my wife and kids weren't at home. They were at my in-laws and I was like, the, the, it was, the rivers were low around here. It was fall. The rivers were still really low. I was like, I just spent three days on my, my bona fide SS 127. I'm going to take this inflatable out on the river. I actually took it on the Monoxy and I said, I'm going to see the difference. And I mm -hmm. took it out, had a motor on it and where it got too shallow for the motor. I was standing up with my paddle, like a stand up paddle board in about three inches of water paddling through upstream through shallow water. And it really hit me there after spending three days on creeks and rivers and a rotor molded kayak and then getting into this inflatable, just how much of an advantage it had on shallow creeks and rivers. And um, I spent the whole day fishing. I think I caught two small bass. Um, you know, it, 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 it really put into perspective what, what those things were made of. And that was a really early prototype. So it was basically just a big floating platform uh, with a seat on it. And then we just started developing from there and, and, making it better so um and guys if you're watching on youtube you can see that i'm sharing my screen right now uh, looking at this thing in the design you with your welding background what did you how did you help make this dream a reality here specifically like i i can see the rails on it how hard is that to take a rail and fuse it to it, you know an inflatable so it, we used the um the yak attack switch pads on there to be able to fasten everything. And then we kind of tie everything in together with the seat and the high low position on the seat to be able to make it really rigid so that uh, like the drop stitch platform that it's made of the it, it's really rigid anyway, because it you'll run about 11 or 11 and a half PSI in it. So it's really rigid. You can put it on the floor in my shop and, and stand on it and you won't your foot won't even make an imprint in it. That's how stiff that uh, center chamber is. And then you got your two outer chambers. But the main thing for me with the fabrication end of it was once we got the rails attached was, all right, now how are we going to attach the seat? We knew we wanted a high low position, mm. but we didn't, you, you didn't want this big elaborate aluminum frame because then you're talking a lot of weight. We want to keep the weight down as much as possible. Most people think of inflatables of, Hey, you can, deflate them and pack them. And then you, you know, they're lightweight. So we wanted to keep it as light as possible. The difference in our inflatable is it's not something that you're going to want to deflate all mm -hmm. the time. I mean, you can deflate it, take the rails off, pack it away for the winter, but it's more of a, you know, it, you just leave it inflated. My, all the ones that I've had, I've never deflated them for any reason. They stay inflated and I keep them outside because I've test the durability of, you know, the UV rays and just, just everything that we could put these things through, we did. And uh, so I've stored them outside the whole time. Um, but yeah, we, so we ordered the seats in. Um, I had to learn how to design the track and uh, design that through a company that I'd gotten information from other companies in the industry saying, hey, I, I need to design this track. Where do I start? And that's part of you know, how it's been from the beginning, just asking people for help. You know, this is a new process for me. How do I design this extruded aluminum and where do I submit the design to so that I can get this manufactured because it's not something that I can do in my shop. When we started, the extrusions we were using were just standard extrusions. It's called 8020 and hmm. you had to end load everything. So you had to load everything on before you even put it on the kayak. And you can't like every time you do it, you always forget something. So you have to unload everything from the end of the track and then reload it. Wow. So I was like, this isn't going to work. We need a top loading design. And uh, 
So we designed the top loading track and then, uh, you know, that was the, the basis for it. And once I got that designed, then we started making the aluminum brackets for the seats. And, uh, we've been, we did five prototypes before we had the model that's on the screen right now. Five. Wow. Yeah. So we were testing. Jeff is a big, um, speed and efficiency guy which speed translates into efficiency or efficiency translates into speed. Either way you want to look at it. Um, most people on a kayak don't care as much about speed. They care about battery life, which is efficiency. So if you have speed, you have that efficiency as well. So uh, it took these designs and we're, we're still constantly working on it, trying to improve upon it. But with that design right there, that is the most efficient design that we have in a 14 foot model. Um, and a lot of people are like, oh, it's 14 foot. That's, that's long. Um, if you go down to 12, you lose, you lose that efficiency. It's not a lot. You're still going in about two and a half inches of water. Why? And with a Torquedo 1103, you're, you're pushing just over six miles per hour, but that 14 foot model, it'll do almost seven miles per hour. Why do you lose efficiency? What is this? What does the length have to do with it? Uh, with the amount of it, it, Basically, it sits lower, a little bit lower in the water because you have less surface area of the kayak on the water. Um, and that length, it just translates into more efficiency. And we're working on different models, different ways. So I th what we're thinking now is the, the two tubes on the side where they come out the back, we call the tubes are called sponsons. Right there. And where they come out the back, you get a little bit of a boil that comes off of the back of them, which creates a little bit of drag. So we're trying to clean that up a little bit so that it doesn't create that boil back there. Because if you look behind a John boat when it's going with an electric motor, you know, a John boat that's not on plane, there's a really large boil that forms behind it when it's not up on plane. Mm. Well, those sponsons kind of do the same thing, not as bad, but they, it will cause drag when that water starts swirling back there. So we're just, the engineering end of it is just playing with different designs and trying to figure out what we can do to clean that up and make them more efficient. That's insane. I just didn't appreciate how much effort and care goes into creating something like this. That's amazing. And the, and the other thing too, after we, we, we got the design where we were happy with it, you know, we started working on everybody's question with an inflatable and fishing is, Oh, well, what if I stick a hook in it? Fishing the MV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, all Patreon members will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle each and every month. You will also get 10% off all of your orders to our newest sponsor, Tiger Crankbaits, who won best in show at the Richmond Fishing Expo. You will also gain membership to our private Facebook group com community where we talk about fishing, what's coming up, and you'll be entered into weekly prize giveaways, private live streams and videos, and so much more. If you would like to see Fishing the DV continue to bring you content, please think about joining. Link in the episode description. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, am, am I going to pop it? And, you know, it, what if I hit uh, a rock ledge, a shoal or whatever? What What is that going to do? So um, with the... Our inflatable is already made of a heavier material, so it, it makes it a little bit heavier. The dry weight on the 14 is about 85 pounds with the seat. So it's a 14 foot kayak, 36 inches wide. It's about 85 pounds. And what we did is on the bottom, there's an extra layer of material there. And that extra layer of material is basically like a skid plate. Mm. And uh, also on the sides where you would land fish, so what Jeff realized with other inflatables that he was trying out before we got into this was like the Susquehanna smallmouth. They had these large spines on their back. If they would bounce off the side of the inflatable, they would make a pinhole. So he wanted to make sure that we didn't have that issue. And also, if you land the fish in the boat and it say it jumps off your bump board and it's flopping around on the floor at your feet, he noticed pinholes in other kayaks there as well. So we doubled up the layers there at your feet on the sides of the kayak and the whole bottom of it. And, and we drag these things. I've drug mine on blacktop. I've drug it across Jeez. rock ledges on the Susquehanna. Um, actually, uh, I guess it was two years ago in the Hobie event, it was really low 
and I got, I paddled up in between these islands and I got to a point where I ran out of water and it was about 20 yards to get back to water or I had to paddle a quarter mile back down river. I'm like, well, I guess we're going to try this thing out. So I grabbed a hold of the handle and I drug it across and it was, it was where there was supposed to be water. So that it was all those um, jagged ledges that are up there and I drug it across it all and, and never even left a mark on the bottom. So uh, it was one of those deals where it was, you, you take the chance of, you know, testing this thing out and it failing during a tournament or you, you paddle back a quarter of a mile. And I was like, I, it, I got nothing to lose. You know, if it puts a hole in one chamber, I've got two more, but to this day, I have yet to put a hole in a chamber or, or have a leak in any of mine. That's insane. The amount of designing and time that you guys put into this thing. Um, and clearly it works. I mean, you, you know, I think a mutual friend that we have, Jake, um, crazy Jake, and you know, he's kicked absolute butt on this one. I think it was the Bassmaster kayak event last, last fall. He did extremely yep. well. And then he won one over the summertime too. So these things, these things are building up a resume for themselves in the tournament scene for sure. Yep. Now, you kind of hinted that you're kind of messing with the design. Could can we expect in the future, like I don't model 2.0 model? Yeah, so we're we're always doing something, and everybody now uh, in the kayak industry seems like they're building kayaks that are shorter and wider. Everybody wants shorter, but everybody wants wider for stability. So one thing about the inflatable, there is no lack of stability. You're not going to find a more stable platform as a kayak on the water than, than any of the inflatables. Um, the, we're, we're working on a shorter model that is just as efficient is what we're trying to do. Um, still not sure if we can, if we're able to make that yet or not, but we have to get it to the point to where we're happy with it. And we think our customers will be happy with it before we even start putting it out there. But yeah, it's always going to be it, moving forward to something bigger, better, you know, smaller, better, whatever the customers want, we're always going to try and keep improving upon it. Is that the 12 foot design that you're, you're hinting at? Well, we have the 12 already. Okay, it's so already it's out there. Um, Jake has the 12. Uh, it's actually my son fished off the 12 last year. He'll be fishing off of it this year. And, um, but we're looking at possibly something a little bit better than a 12. And, Damn. We also were, we, we've got the concept out there and we've proved to people that it's tough, that it works, that it's efficient, that it's a great fishing platform. And now we want to make something that is more marketable as far as price range without sacrificing quality. So we're trying to figure out ways that we can make a cheaper price point one that still has all the great features of the the osprey 14 and 12 but how we can cut costs a little bit you know one of the ways we can we can help get the price down is to make the rails a little bit shorter um and and just different things like that just ways to to get the price down to get someone in an inflatable kayak and maybe they're happy with that and they stay with that or they're, maybe they're like oh you know i'm a little more into it now, maybe I want to go with something a little bit bigger so I can take some more gear. I would like to say first, I mean, this is a fantastic price point for basically to make it for an elite river kayak setup. I and mean, this is like a fine tooled instrument for where you're supposed to take it. Um, I don't, I don't think the price point's too bad at all for these bad boys. Now, if, if I wanted to buy one 14 mm -hmm. foot, 12 foot, which one should I be getting as a avid tournament angler? Uh, honestly, it, it all just, it's personal preference. Um, like I said, you lose a little bit of speed and efficiency with the 12. There's some guys that just don't want the extra couple of feet. Um, the stability is almost identical. Uh, it'll go a little bit, the, the 14 will go a little bit shallower than the 12. Um, but really it's, it's more or less personal preference. We really created the 12 footer for someone who just refused to buy a 14 foot. Kayak. <laughs> you know, it's, it's honestly, it, it's, it's, it catches more people's attention than a 14 foot kayak. A lot That's of people, sad. they hear 14 and they just turn away. That's really sad. Um, okay. That, that, that helps me out a little bit. <laughs> so, well, you know, it, as we pivot from this, from the kayaks to really 
the fishing in the area. How much do you fish the Monocacy still? Since you, I mean, you're in the Mount Airy area, so Antietam, Monocacy, Upper Potomac, pretty much seems like where your bread and butter is. Correct? Yeah, um, not as much as I would like. I, you know, I there's a lot of memories on that river, and also the Upper Potomac River where I lived outside of Hancock. I want to. I've been saying for two years now. I need to get back up there. Um, here, here's my thing. I'm so busy with work that I, I fish tournaments so that I fish because mm-hmm. if I don't schedule, like I, I have a schedule in our office. Um, my wife and I share an office. She works from home as well. She teleworks and, uh, and on her schedule, she's a schedule person and I'm not, I'm kind of just a, you know, it's in my head and I, and I figured out, but she needs to know when I'm going fishing. So at the beginning of the season, I'll put it on my schedule. Uh, or on her schedule, hey, these are the dates of the tournaments that I want to fish. And then at that, that point, I'm committed, you know, barring there is no big sports event for my kids or anything. Um, my kids' sports come first no matter what. And if, you know, if I might miss a baseball game or, or one football game, but if it's a if it's a playoff game or a big, yeah. if it's a big game or like a big wrestling match, I won't miss those. Um, so we figure all that out at the beginning of the season. And then I put it on the calendar and I'm committed at that point. So I really don't get a whole lot of time to just go fun fishing. Um, if I'm fishing, I'm pre-fishing for a tournament or I'm in a tournament. But um, occasionally I'll, I'll get away and, and I'll do some filming with Jeff or I'll get to go hang out with Jake um, or some other friends that I've met. You know, But it's it's rare that I just get to go fun fishing. Yeah. And I, yeah, I understand that family absolutely comes first. Um, I live between, uh, Hancock and Williamsport, so I'm very familiar with that whole area. Uh, so yeah. if, yeah, if you ever get a break, I can definitely take you out there. So tournaments, what is there a tournament series you like to fish or you just kind of just pick them? Um, so I started fishing. My first tournament was with mid Atlantic kayak bass fishing. Um, that was three years ago. And the first year, I think I did like two or three tournaments. And then I've been kind of hooked ever since. The The guys are great. Uh, Jake's a big part of that. And uh, Aaron Fetterman, our president, you know, as of last year, you know, just great people. Aaron's actually one of my travel buddies when we do national level tournaments. Um, but like at MAKBF is the main one. And I've been really close to that angler of the year mark the past two years and it's just slipped out of my grip you know, the, the last tournament of the year, I think I put a lot of pressure on myself and don't do as well as I should. Um, and mid Atlantic kayak bass fishing has got some of the best anglers in our area. And, and it's, if you slip up, you know, you, you're going to, you're going to drop a little bit, but I like it because it's competitive, but separate from what I used to do with the jet boat fishing, like it's, it's like any other boat fishing, you know, you, boat fishing, there's a lot of, a lot of cutthroat and a lot of like, it's just not as friendly. You go into kayak fishing from go, everybody was, you know, Hey, if you need anything, we're here for you. If you got any questions, like someone will sacrifice their tournament day to help you out if you're in a bad spot. And and that's what I really like about kayak fishing is the camaraderie and, you know, everybody's just out to help everybody. We're competitive, but at the end of the day, if someone needs something, you know, everybody is, is willing to help. And that's what I think I like the most about it. But, uh, so mid Atlantic kayak bass fishing is the main one, but I do some national stuff. Um, I just got back from Hobie down on the Harris chain. Um, had my, my first good finish at at a national level tournament on the new river last year. I, I missed cutting a check by one spot, uh, for Hobie. And then I went down and a new attitude this year, you know, I, the national level tournaments, they, they tend to be a little more stressful because you want to go down on the bigger scene and you want to do well. And uh, I put more pressure on myself this year. I said, you know what? I'm going to Florida in January and it's going to be 80 degrees. I'm going to go have a good time and just catch fish, you know, no matter where I place in the tournament. And uh, day one, I think I was sitting like 25th place or something like that. And day two, I had a really good bag of fish, ended up in fourth place. Um, so my goal coming out of day one was just, Hey, have a good day tomorrow and cash a check to, you know, tomorrow. And, um, about midday, the fish were just doing something that was predictable. And I just, 
it was one of those days where you felt like you couldn't do anything wrong. And I went from, I think it was 25th and then ended up in fourth and then, um, you know, locked in my spot for the tournament of champions for Hobie, which I'm, I'm ecstatic about that because it's back on Santee Cooper. I've been there twice and both times that place has treated me well in practice and on tournament day, it's bit me hard. So I'm looking for a little redemption there. How hard was it for you to make the transition to Floridian waters? Um, do you have a lot of experience on tidal waters or is it just, would you say more of your roots is like a river rat, the, the traditional type of river rat, which is non-tidal? My, so grew up on the rivers, cut my teeth fishing for smallmouth uh, on the upper Potomac and um, the lower Potomac and the upper Bay are some of my favorite fisheries. So tidal water is, is a, it holds a, a really big spot, you know, when it comes to fishing, I, I love fishing tidal water. Um, the, the lower Potomac and the upper Bay do not fish anything like waters down South. Uh, I say that, but I, I will tell you the first time I went South, we went to, um, uh, Seminole Lake Seminole and I could not find rock anywhere. And up here you, 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 there's rock everywhere, you know, hard bottom rock down there. Everything is sand and muck and found some wood and it, and it really, it, it really was, I was just shocked. I didn't know what to do. And, um, since then I've been to, uh, Murray, which there's not a whole lot of rock, you know, hard structure oh, on Murray. That, that's um, place is completely different. Yeah. But uh, so I went to Florida, uh, 2021 and we fished the Kissimmee chain first time in Florida, definitely like way out of my element. Didn't know what to do. Had a pretty decent time pre-fishing. Um, I caught some decent fish, no, no Florida giants or anything. And then um, that it was predicting some pretty rough weather, uh, either the first day or the second day. So we played it safe and stayed out of the wind. I did some creek fishing. I think I caught three fish the first day of the tournament. And then the second day of the tournament, um, you know, same thing, two or three fish. Um, didn't do real well, but learned a lot about Florida and what to look for and everything. And then uh, last year we went to the Harris chain with Hobie and I, I did did good and my goal last year I just wanted to catch five fish both days and um, I did I caught five fish both days I, I ended like mid pack um, and I but I really started to put it together at the end of day two of the tournament a pattern you know how the Florida fish set up and how they're a little bit different and then What'd this you year out? going down what's that what'd you figure out so this year going down um the, I knew the weather was going to be where we needed it to be because they just had a cold front come through and we're, we went from a cold front to 60 degrees at night and 80 degrees during the day. So I knew it was only going to get better every day. So I went down the one place that I wanted to fish last year. I never did. And I was like, that's one place I'm definitely going this year, which was Lake Griffin. Um, and it just, it had a lot more vegetation than most places from what I heard last year. So we pre-fished there. I pre-fished there the first day. My first fish within 10 minutes of the day was a 20 and a quarter largemouth. So I was like, okay, this is, this is a good sign. So I just, I, I kept moving around. I didn't want to fish that spot. So I kept moving around and I had a really good day pre-fishing. The second day I fished some stuff that I fished last year with, with no luck and it just didn't look right. It didn't feel right. So Friday we went back out to Griffin and I was able to put like, patterns together a couple of different patterns what didn't feel right um so there i wasn't seeing fish on the graph the grass wasn't like it was last year um everything was a little bit farther behind uh -huh. and uh water was dirtier in places that were, where it wasn't dirty last year um and the vegetation was the main thing so friday went back out to griffin and griffin in the marsh, it set up just like the upper Chesapeake Bay. There hmm. was there was hydrilla and milfoil everywhere. And you had some some timber occasionally with some brush, and you had some pads. So um, pre fishing, I just kind of went out and like I do the upper the upper bay. I'll go throw a chatterbait and rip it through grass out in the middle, find an area where the fish are biting. And typically, if there's one fish there in that area, there are more than one fish and uh 
I had some bedded fish as well, but I, I knew right off the bat, I wasn't going to spend a whole lot of time on bedded fish. I said, first thing the first morning I will try. And I had one hooked up and it got off at the kayak and I had a, there was a seven pounder that I couldn't get to react to the bait. So I was like, you know what? I was 45 minutes into the day. I was like, I'm done with the bed fish. I'm not sticking to this because I just don't have confidence that I'm going to be able to make these fish bite. And tomorrow, which on Saturday, the weather was great. On Sunday, it was going to be howling 15 to 20 mile an hour winds all day. So um, I just went and uh, fished that grass like I would have the upper bay on day one. And I caught a decent limit. And then day two in the morning, it was going to be cloudy, overcast. Uh, whereas day one, it was not. So I knew in the morning it was going to be a little bit different of a bite. So I went out and flipped brush piles and I caught a decent limit right off the bat within the first hour and a half. Hmm. And when the sun came out, I went back to ripping the chatterbait through the grass and that's where all my big bites came. I pretty much called out all my fish from the morning. I think I had one left and, uh, at the end of the day, it was, it was really windy and I was just letting the wind blow me around and I was just fan casting wherever the wind was blowing me in the area that I knew they were going to be at. And, uh, I cast it into the wind. It was like the last 10 minutes of the day. I cast it into the wind and I got a bird's nest in my bait caster. I was like, Oh, so I was picking it out and it was, I know it was 10 or 15 seconds and I got it out and I reeled it back up and it was stuck in the grass. At least I thought it was stuck in the grass. And when I went to go rip it out of the grass, I actually set the hook in the fish's mouth. The fish was sitting there with it in his mouth, waiting on me to set the hook. That's what happened. But it's just one of those days where I couldn't do anything wrong. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, after I caught that fish, I checked the, uh, the, 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 uh, scores on tourney X and, uh, I'd went from fifth place to fourth place by a quarter of an inch ahead of That's one insane. of the guys that fishes MAKBF with us. And, uh, when they turned it off, I was still sitting in fourth and I was like, there's no way this is going to hold because the last half hour, everybody always, uh, somebody uploads fish and, uh, and it stood, I was, I was really shocked it. So the second day on the Harris chain ended up being pretty tough for a lot of people this year. When it's your time, it's your time. And it just always comes down to decision-making. It's uh, how many people I've, I've had the the pleasure of talking to. It does. It's that small little decision that makes the biggest difference. Yeah. And and then we cut to, I, I had the winner of the Hobie event on the new river, um, RJ Hoover on, but you are, a, I guess for the new river, you're, you're a semi-local, what were your thoughts about that event and going down there to the, to the Jurassic park that is the new river? Yeah. So it's a place I've always wanted to fish. And, uh, when I heard that Hobie was going there, I started asking, you know, guys with MAKBF, you know, the year or as soon as they announced it, I started talking to people and I'm like, what do, what do I need to know? And when do we want to go pre-fish this? And, uh, a couple of the guys I talked to, they said, you got to really be careful down there. Don't ever go down there without a buddy. Like, it, it's treacherous. Um, and I really didn't know what to expect. I've driven over it before, but you know, from, from the bridges, it's really hard to tell how bad it can actually be. Mm -hmm. Our, our first day down there, we, we really learned like it's, you know, you gotta be careful. You really got to plan your trips out. Um, you know, make sure you have somebody with you and pick your, pick your lanes really well, you know, how you want to go down the river. So, um, you know, the one guy that was with me flipped his kayak on, Oh geez the Friday before the tournament lost all but one rod. Um, most of his tackle, uh, and, and we had just, so he, we were going down river. He went around one side of the Island. I went around the other and he went around the one side because it was deeper and it had more flow. And I went around the other side because nobody went that way. And I'm like, I'm in an inflatable. Like, even if I have to drag, I'm good. I want to go down here. There might be a deep hole with some fishing. And I found a, a semi deep hole with some fish in it, but nothing big. And I got to the other end and I had had to drag a little bit and I figured he would have already been ahead of me. So I got down there and I didn't see him and I'm looking around I'm like, man, where is he at? And I looked downstream and there was a bridge down there and I saw this, you know, giant rock in the middle of the river and didn't think anything of it. And I looked up river and I didn't see him and I looked down Well, the rock was moving and his kayak was upside down and he was actually holding on to his kayak floating with it. And so funny story i didn't have my torpedo it was pre-fishing we were allowed to use it but we had we had parked down below with my truck and took his truck up to the next ramp up to be able to to go down river and i forgot my motor um actually i didn't forget my motor i forgot 
uh, I forgot my batteries. I had the motor, but no batteries. So I was paddling. And when I saw that that was him, I paddled as fast as I could. I actually paddled down through a, like a, a heavy class three rapid and um, got down to him and he was exhausted. You know, he had been trying to get his kayak to shore and um, you know, he just, he was exhausted. So I had no motor and I told him, I was like, hold on to the back of my kayak. I'll paddle us to shore. And it took me 15 minutes to get, you know, his outback. He had a Hobie outback with him holding on to it back to shore. And, um, and it was tough, but like, it, it just showed you how quickly things could go bad on that river. And there were a lot of people that flipped and lost a fair amount of, you know, gear and tackle down there. But, um, I can't wait to go back. Like it, it was, it was an experience, but the area I fished both days, I was standing so we could portage in that tournament. So I was standing on a rock that was probably 10 foot around, it, 10 foot from, from center. I mean, from me, from side to side, all the way around, it was like 10 foot. And I pulled the, the front of the inflatable up on it and kind of beached it on this rock at the base of a waterfall. And I fished there for two days straight. <laughs> so crazy. Um, and the fish just kept reloading. Uh, it was chatterbait, whopper plopper, senko. Uh, just kept throwing different stuff because it, that you would get one or two fish to bite and then they would stop. And then you'd have to throw something different. They would bite that and just circulating through the baits. And, uh, and they, you know, after a while you'd start back with where you started and, and, and you would catch some more, but it was really the only place that I had had multiple decent fish. Um, we caught a lot of fish. You catch a lot of small fish down there, but it was the only place I could go and catch quality fish. I actually caught a, uh, like a, 28 inch striper down there that I thought was one of those new river giant smallmouth. I didn't even realize there were striper in there. I didn't have a striper in there either. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a good, it was about a minute before I could get this thing high enough in the water column to even see what it was. I'm freaking out thinking I got a giant smallmouth and, and here comes a striper. So. Dude, they have some monsters in there. And what I think about was so cool about that event. And I was real wrong about what the lengths were going to be. It is, it's so wild. It's like one of the few places that feels untamed that you could have a major tournament. And yep. like we said, everyone flips. It's like, that doesn't happen in most places you go to where you, right. t- it could be a waterfall that you're going to go down. Um, I don't know. I really hope they do end up going back there. That'd be really cool. Yeah. yeah I, I'll tell you one of the biggest like saving graces down there was Jody queen putting his post up about, you know, what to avoid, where you can flow from ramp to ramp. What, what, ramp to ramp floats to avoid that was that was really a giant thing for for everybody who paid attention to it because he really laid it out and let you know um you know don't go here or you're safe to do here and he actually went into detail as like what class the rapids were and everything else so that was huge that's so crazy that yeah yeah that's really crazy guys yeah go check out the new river um i have ethan stone on in a couple of weeks here for a live stream to talk about just fishing the new river as we're getting back into the spring season baby which is absolutely awesome so what is uh you know to, to kind of like go back for old circle hill to your tournament season coming up what's the first event that you have coming up uh and what are your thoughts on it um the my next event will be logan martin lake for hobie and um pretty excited about that 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 seems like it's going to be a fishery that kind of suits me i'm not much of a lake fisherman but there are some pretty decent streams that flow into it so um anybody who knows me knows that i go to skinny water where a lot of other people can't go which is where the inflatable really plays to my strength uh because i can get to places that uh say a hobie that drafts in seven inches of water can't get to when i'm drafting in two inches of water um but yeah, so we got Logan Martin, and then my next one is when MAKBF season starts. We're going to the Junietta. Uh, we're going on a two-day April tournament up there, which should be just smallmouth giants. Do you have forward-facing sonar on your personal kayak? I I have it, and I have not put it on the inflatable because I don't – like, I had it on my Predator because uh, that's I actually have Jake Harshman's old Predator, and um, I had it on there. I fished a fair amount with it. I like it. I think it's neat when you, when you find fish and you catch fish on it, it just, it's not, it's not completely for me. Um, it has its place like everything else, but actually a bunch of us, um, we're just now switching over from Garmin. We're going to Humminbird and we're going to mega 360 because the mega 360 seems to fit my style of fishing a little bit better. 
Um, now the Mega 360 and Live together, that would probably work really well. But I just feel like that's a lot of stuff. It's a lot to of have stuff, on the kayak right now that I, that I don't want. I actually just did an install for um, a young lady that's fishing with MB, NBKBA this year. She just put the uh, Mega 360 and Mega Live uh, on her kayak. I did that. I did that install for her. So um, I have both on my Ranger boat, but. If you ask most people, they usually pick forward-facing sonar. And, and you guys are going left while everyone's going right, sort of speak. So, so why 360? Um, because I like, so I use side imaging all the time. And the only downfall for me in side imaging is you're, you're, you always got to be moving for it to, to get a good picture and for it to work properly. The 360 allows us to sit still and to scan the area around us and, I fish a lot of shallow water, which the 360 I feel is better suited for the shallow water than the live. Um, that and being in a kayak, I struggled with staying on the fish um, and with the with the live. You know, I'm always mm -hmm. messing with the transducer while I'm while I'm casting and stuff, and it felt that it just took away from the fishing aspect of it. Whereas if I can go and locate structure you know, and I can locate fish with the, the mega 360 as well. But if I can just locate the structure, that is more than half the battle for me. And it's easier to locate the structure. I feel with the mega 360 than the live. I, I agree with that. I, I think the forward facing sonar is also, I think it's where, what your DNA is and your heritage. If you grew up fishing the Shenandoah, the upper James, the Susquehanna, you know, you're not using forward facing sonar as much as if you live on Lake Murray, you know, that, right. that place you really are used to fishing 30 feet plus deep of water, tracking schools, right. things like that. Um, and that makes, that makes actually a, a lot of sense, really. Um, I'm typically fishing in 10 foot or less of water. <laughs> That's crazy. I, I can't stand fishing deeper than that. Do you feel like you, and you know, I'll, there's a lot of pros. I feel like they say you have to be well-rounded, whether it's a kayak or a boat. But then you have yeah. the Keiths, the Keith Pochets and the Coxes of the world. They're like, nah, this is fine. Do you feel like you have to be well-rounded in the kayak world or just as a fisherman in general? Or can you just be really good at one thing and make it work? I I honestly think that there are resident fish in shallow water in any body of water um, year round. You just got to figure out where they're at. Uh, there might not be as many of them and you're not finding those big schools. Um, honestly, I... I've tried to fish deeper. I just don't have the patience. I like to be moving. I'm a power fisherman. I like to be constantly doing something. Um, and I've never really, it would be different if I, if I figured them out one or two times and I built that confidence, but I'm a huge confidence fisherman. I try not to get out of my comfort zone. Actually two years ago, I went from you know, like everybody else, you see baits, you're like, oh, that looks great. You buy it and you throw it once or twice and you don't have confidence in it yet. So then it just sits in your tackle box yep. and you never use it. I have my confidence baits and I also have my confidence cover colors. And I've taken more than two thirds of the tackle that I had two years ago and I don't even take it with me anymore. And I still find myself once a year being like, I don't know why I bought this, you know, and, and I'll take it out of my tackle box. But it's you know, I, I throw, I like spinner baits and chatter baits, obviously, because I'm a power fisherman, but, you know, I'll throw a Senko four different ways. A fluke is a, is a big bait for me. Um, but I don't get out of my comfort zone too much because if I don't have confidence in it, I don't fish as well as I do with something I do have confidence in. And I typically catch more on the baits that I have confidence in yeah. only because I have the confidence. That is such a critical part when you're learning any new technique. It's like if you want to learn how to punch, you can't, you got to go somewhere that you can actually punch and have success. If you want to fish deep, you got to go to like the, you have to fish deep. Um, Trey, I don't want to, I don't want to keep you way, way too much longer, but I have one more question. As a guy that grew up fishing the upper Potomac, a place that I call home, Shenandoah, but you get to travel all over the earth and you get to fish the Susquehanna a lot. And really, does anything you learn in the Upper Potomac translate to the Susquehanna and places like that? Or is the Susquehanna just its absolute own beast? It, yeah. Um, so like in the springtime, you know, you, you look for those boulders that are coming out of the water that are heating up that the fish are going to gravitate to. All the small like and fishing eddies and, and how to fish 
uh, the moving water, how to read it. I learned a lot of that stuff on the upper Potomac, upper Potomac River. The only difference for me going to the Susquehanna is bait choice. Um, it's hard for me to not throw some type of power fishing moving bait on the Susquehanna. There are days where I probably should pick up a Senko or a Fluke, but I just can't do it because nothing beats smallmouth up there crushing a chatterbait or a whopper plopper or you know spinner bait and actually this past year i just started throwing uh large paddle tails up there so i'll throw like hollow body paddle tails that are six and seven inches long and those fish they just annihilate them and it's hmm. it's hard for me to slow down up there and fish something smaller fish it slower um and there's days where i go up there and i could absolutely catch more fish and, and maybe even better fish if i slow it down you know we'll go fishing with jeff little and he'll be out there finesse fishing and jake and i'll be throwing whopper ploppers and spinner baits and chatter baits and he'll catch a lot of fish but we know when we catch a fish we're catching the good quality fish and you know we might not get as many bites but they're usually better quality um and jake and i joke about that all the time jake's like i'll go up there and skunk before i throw you know, a Ned rig or a hair jig or something, but which is funny uh, because for the Shenandoah and the upper Potomac, the hair jig, I mean, that's like all the guys in the wintertime throw that stuff and, and some on the yeah. Susquehanna, but, and I've had so many people on that say that the, the Susquehanna is power fishing. Like, so does, does any of that stuff translate in reverse from Susquehanna to the upper Potomac or is the upper Potomac just fish more classical? It, so, um, the Shenandoah, we fished that two years ago. Um, I caught my biggest fish on a buzz bait, but I, I tried to throw what, what I would normally throw on the Susquehanna and, and there again, I didn't have the confidence in those baits that I fished on the Susquehanna on the Shenandoah or on the upper Potomac, because I'm so used to fishing them a certain way that I, I, I fish what I know works, but, um, I, I don't think you get quite as many of those fish on the upper Potomac or the Shenandoah to go after those, those, you know, uh, moving baits, the power fishing baits, as well as you do on the Susquehanna. They're just, I mean, you hit that day, you, you, there's yeah. always that day where they'll eat just about anything, but, uh, on a, on a typical day, I think you got to slow it down. Um, I honestly think, you know, like the Shenandoah and then the upper Potomac as well. Now it, they see a lot more kayak traffic than, than what you see on the, on the Susquehanna because the Susquehanna is so large there you know most people that do floats up there they stick to one side of the river and they don't do a lot of exploring so we get up there get on the torpedoes and we get into some some tight spots that you know most people aren't floating through um whereas the the upper Potomac and the Shenandoah are kind of narrower and when those yeah. people come floating down through there you know they the fish see them but uh, I think they're just very aware of people more on the upper Potomac and the Shenandoah than they are on the Susquehanna. I th I 100% agree with that. I think it's also a forge thing too. I just think you're dealing, I think the shiner that's on the Susky, it's just, they're used to chasing stuff like that way more with right. versus mad toms and crayfish, which I really feel like make up the majority of the diet on the Shenandoah and the upper Potomac. But again, I, I could be, I could be completely wrong about that. Yeah, I was, I was completely shocked with the amount of people I saw the day that we fished the Shenandoah. It was easily, 30 or 40 people floating down that day. Cause I actually started out of campgrounds and I went up river, had to drag a lot, but um, I went four miles up and then floated my way back down. But I passed so many people on the way up and I had like six people floating down with me when I came back down. So. Were you on the main stem? Yeah. Watermelon park. Uh, no, I was up closer to, um, uh, below 50. Uh, I'm trying to think of where I was at. Um, I think I know the area that you're talking about because that's where all the floaters go with the tubes and yeah, stuff. Yeah, well, there was a there's a low head dam up there. Um, I yeah. motored up to the low head dam. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I came back. So I just you know I do a lot of map study, and I just saw that area, and it looked like it would be the hardest area for someone to get in there and fish it and pick it apart if you weren't doing a float because. Mm. Uh, when you're doing a float, you, you kind of have to keep moving because there's so much distance between ramps. And, um, I was halfway between one ramp and the other. So actually at the end of the day, I had, to, in order to get service to upload my fish, I had to get off the water and, and drive 20 minutes towards Fort, 
uh, front royal to be able to upload my fish. So at the end of the day, the last quarter of a mile down the river, I was wide open on the throttle. And then when I hit those ledges, I was raising the motor up and sliding across with the, the inflatable. That's one of the beauties of the inflatable too. Yeah. It's completely flat, goes in two inches of water. And when you hit rocks, it just goes right over top of them. You don't get high sided or anything. Trey, th- I really, I know you're a busy man. I really appreciate all the time that, that, that you gave me today. Um, is there anything that we can promote or anything that you have coming up that you'd like to like to promote? Um, I mean, not at this time, nothing new, you know, we're still pounding out the rock guards and, you know, we're a torpedo dealer. We sell motors, we do installs, um, which this time of the year obviously is our busiest time of the year for installs. And you know, we rig anything from inflatables to pro anglers and, and we've done, just about all the electronics you can think of. And um, I mean, I've done, uh, I did a pro angler for a guy one time where I think he just the electronics with the motor and electronics alone, I think he had like $8,000 just in, just in parts. Um, So we, we do a little bit of everything, you know, if you need something rigged or if you just have a question, you know, an idea for something that you need made for yours. Um, We always take them all into consideration. We don't develop a whole lot of new products, but if it's something that we feel that is beneficial to a lot of people um, and at the end of the day, you know, it it has to make some money. But um, if it's something that can benefit a lot of people, we're always open to hear what you have. Guys, as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. If you want, go check us out on iHeart, Apple, Spotify, or you could be on YouTube. Also, check out our Patreon, our overall goal. We're going to be starting a nonprofit once we hit some of our goals to help supplementally stock some of our fisheries. Like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.